Greetings and salutations and welcome to a video about audio. This time around we're going to be talking about my HH Scott RS30 AM FM stereo receiver. I've done a couple of these audio related vids lately and they have been very well received and so I'm going to do another one. I don't think this is going to become a regular feature on the channel. I, I just don't get new audio music record things to play with that often. But lately I've picked up quite a few things and I want to actually go through my entire system in this video and kind of tell you what I got set up and what I'm doing and what my philosophy is because there are guys out there that are really into that sort of thing. Uh, this little receiver was hand delivered to me today by the fellow who rebuilt it and refurbished it and went through and cleaned it up and it is absolutely amazing and there's a really crazy story that goes along with how I got this particular box. Now to talk a little bit about Scott, Scott is a name in high fidelity audio that goes back to the 50s and they had a, a great reputation and um, I never really had any Scott stuff except for a pair of speakers. When I was in high school my dad picked up this set of used Scott 312D speakers and they were huge with 12 inch woofers in them and they're just awesome sounding speakers. They were wonderful. But about this period of time what I was really into and I was in high school in the 80s when this came out I was into a Kai. I had a lot of a Kai equipment and I had I think it, by 87 I had picked up a, a couple of techniques tape decks and I had more of a hodgepodge but most of the stuff I had was a Kai so I didn't have any Scott equipment uh, just I don't even remember seeing it in the store actually to tell you the truth around that time so uh, I didn't have anything to go on when I got this particular receiver other than memories of the speakers and what I have read about Scott and I have to say that it has been a very impressive little unit to play with and I, I spent like the entire day listening to music through this thing because I was just kind of fascinated with it so let's get a better picture here uh, this is what the unit looks like this is a publicity photo from somewhere not the highest resolution but uh, kind of a dumpy little guy to tell you the truth uh, this is kind of the way things looked back in the 80s and of course we have those power meters over there on the right or left rather that uh, they <laughs> they to get those to work you have to crank that thing like way up you'll notice in the picture that the volume control is about halfway up let me tell you what if you crank this thing to half volume it will blow you out of the room or at least it will with the speakers that I'm using so we'll go from uh, left to right here you got a power switch you got a headphone jack and then you got that lovely little power meter which is pretty pretty much useless on this on this box but it's there and then you have uh, bass and treble slider controls and a balance slider and then you have the volume control that's kind of over toward the middle there and then we have uh, the radio section and that's pretty much a standard AM FM digital radio I do like the big tuning buttons on it uh, you can choose AM and FM you can choose mono or stereo for the FM and then you can set presets and uh, the preset buttons are right under the dial there and then you'll see between the volume control and the selector controls we have a high filter which basically when you kick that in it cuts everything off above probably about 8 kilohertz and the idea there is that if you're listening to a scratchy record, a hissy tape, or really bad FM re reception, that you can kind of chop the highs off, and it makes things a bit more pleasant. Uh, you don't see those sorts of things on modern amplifiers at all. Um, you just really don't. I've been looking around online at the uh, the newer crop of, I guess, low lower end of the market amplifiers, and there's a little bit of a resurgence in receivers and amplifiers uh, that aren't too terribly expensive. Yamaha's making some nice ones. and uh, There's a Sony out there that's, I don't know, a lot of the ones I looked at from like Sony and Sherwood and stuff, they seem to be like, you know, com uh, you know receiver on a chip sort of things. And they just didn't 
do much for me, and I have no use for Bluetooth of any kind, that sort of thing. Uh, so I'm looking for a traditional receiver. Uh, but anyway, I digress. Uh, this receiver has no loudness circuit on it, which is a button that some of you guys are probably really used to seeing if you've been around audio for a long time. And I can tell you that it doesn't need it. It uh, has a very nice sound without the artifice of boosting the bass and the treble a little bit, which is what the uh, loudness curve does. On a lot of amplifiers that have a loudness curve, I'd turn it off anyway. So uh, then we have the selector buttons, and this is where it gets kind of interesting. The first button there is phono, and that's for a magnetic phono cartridge, moving magnet. And then the next one is labeled tuner. And what's curious about this little guy is that when you are listening to the radio, if you turn it on, the radio is always on. And in, in usually what I've seen in a lot of receivers is that when you, you know, push the button to listen to a, a CD or, or the phono or whatever, that the, the radio turns off. This one doesn't. The radio just keeps on going. And you can, like, put it on CD and then you can put your headphones on and you can crank it all the way up and you can just hear this slight whisper of the radio playing way in the background. Now, at normal volume, can't hear that at all. And if you were really worried about that, you could always just tune it to like a blank AM station and nothing would bleed through. But believe me, it's, it's so far down that nobody's going to be able to hear it unless you're really listening for it. But it's kind of weird uh, that it does that. And then... Next to it there, they have the CD slash DAT input, and it is labeled that, D-A-T, Digital Audio Tape. In 1987, and I remember this well, all the buzz in the music industry and the hi-fi world was about digital audio tape, and that is a format that never took off in homes. It did get a lot of play in recording studios and radio stations. And for many, many years, we had DAT machines in the radio stations. But I don't know of anybody who had one at home. And the curious story about DAT is, is that the record companies were trying desperately to kill it. They did not want digital audio tape out there. Because their biggest fear was that people would use that to record CDs to tape and then record tapes for their friends and then the record industries you know would lose money that was the biggest deal and of course the the given uh, idea about digital at that point in time was was that it was perfect and that a digital copy of a digital copy of a digital copy would be indiscernible from the original uh, that's not necessarily true there's generation loss in digital but anyway they were afraid of it and they tried to stomp it out and by the time that it actually did get out there to people at home it was the format was just dead i mean the the buzz was gone people had lost interest and they were expensive anyway and i can tell you from experience using dat machines that they were a big pain in the butt it was sort of like a the tapes looked like a miniaturized videotape and they ran kind of like VCRs. So they weren't like, if you're old enough to remember using a cassette deck with a pause control or even an open reel machine. They weren't like that. They were, they were a little bit wonky to work with. But anyway, this particular little amplifier has a DAT slash CD input. And I think the whole thing is funny because uh, it reminded me when I saw that today of all of the hoopla at the time and the wrangle that was going on and all the hi-fi mags were talking about it. And little did they know that, what was it, 10 years later with MP3 coming along and people having personal computers and uh, MP3 players and iPods and whatnot and sharing stuff online that the MP3 would do to the record industry what they were always afraid cassettes and dats would do. So, yeah. <laughs> Held it off, guys, but you didn't, you didn't make it stop. You should have just gave us our dat machines, I'm telling you. Everything would have been fine. Anyway, uh, and finally, the uh, last button there is a tape loop, which means that you can take a tape deck and run audio through it, and it comes back through the amplifier. So really simple, basic stuff there. And that's it. That's the front controls. That's all there is on this machine. And that's one of the reasons I bought it. I was looking for something that was just extraordinarily simple. I 
like simple when it comes to audio equipment gang I really do the more buttons knobs and features that you have on something the more chance of it breaking or having something not working right which is going to mess up the audio and color the sound the simpler the better I even like these old slide controls because they tend to be a little bit better balanced than the round uh, potentiometers that you found in a lot of audio equipment of this ilk and at this price point they just didn't put really great pots in the stuff back then and uh, it could cause issues with the audio but the little sliders not that bad and some of you might be looking at this and saying to yourself this sort of kind of looks like a techniques receiver and I noticed that too I had a techniques receiver in the early 90s that kind of sort of looked like this a little bit but it wasn't laid out this way and makes me wonder whether at that point in time that Scott wasn't maybe borrowing from techniques or buying parts from the same people or maybe even rebranded I don't know I have no clue I haven't opened up the amp to look inside either so I don't know what the parts say inside that would be that would tell you right there if you saw uh, Matsushita in there which is the name of the company that owned Panasonic and techniques that would tell you right there so let's go ahead and take another look at this and this is the receiver sitting on a table up and running this is not my receiver in this picture this is somebody else's because mine is in the darkest corner of a room and it's really hard to get a picture of and it's kind of up in the stand in such a way that it's kind of half covered up but it's just another look at it and mine the screen for the uh, radio display there it uh, it's it, mine's green and this one looks more bluish to me of course that could just be my eyes but there you go and a better picture so all of you audio heads are going show us the back show us the back if you're ever going to sell one of these on eBay let me tell you something right now make sure that you include detailed pictures of the back people who are into audio and especially amplifiers and receivers and stuff like that we like to see what we're plugging things into. I've been looking on eBay at a lot of audio equipment, and you'd be amazed how many people do not show a picture of the back. Well, I'm not buying a picture. I'm not buying it unless you show me what's on the back. It ain't going to happen. Just letting you know. Uh, so we're starting over here at uh, the back left side of the unit, and we have the antenna inputs. This is really cool, gang. Um, the first input you see is for the center conductor of a 75 ohm cable that would be if you had an antenna on the roof or you had an input from a 75 ohm antenna of some sort and you put the center conductor here you put the shield here and if you're going to be using twin lead 300 ohm then you would put it between these two terminals I love radios that are set up this way love it love it love it uh, because you don't have to use a ballon to make one type of antenna work next to the other and this also lets me get away with uh, using a homemade dipole antenna which is stuffed up in the frame of a window right now I need to get good antennas that's my next project I'm either going to build some antennas for this radio or I am going to buy some I don't know which uh, the AM section <clears throat> excuse me the AM section in this radio is not that great it is on a scale of one to ten I would say that it's about maybe a six and I am going off this old um, loop antenna that I have left over from a receiver that I bought a long time ago from Radio Shack that it's been in the bottom of a box and it's really not that good of an antenna to begin with and I couldn't really get a whole lot of juice into the AM radio it didn't seem to be all that sensitive so I'm going to have to come up with a, a good antenna system for that. Probably put up a long wire or buy something. Um, but audio quality wise, it's pretty typical of the time. It probably tops off at like, I don't know, 6 kilohertz. That's the high end. Uh, at this particular point in time, they just really didn't put anything into AM receivers at all. The FM side is really good if you have enough signal going into it. Uh, so right now with my little dipole antenna I can pick up the strong stations really well and they stay in stereo and the stereo separation is nice but I'll know more when I put some real antennas on the radio 
I haven't done that. I don't really care that much about the radio. There's a few stations around here that I'd kind of like to listen to, both AM and FM, but it's not part of my daily life like it used to be, radio. So we have the ground pole for the turntable, and then we have the phono inputs right and left, and this takes a magnetic input, which is a moving magnet cartridge. It couldn't use a moving coil, be too low. I'm currently running a an Audio Technica AT ninety five EX, which came with my turntable, and there's a video up about that turntable, and it seems to work great with this little amplifier. Uh, in the manual for the specifications, it said that the noise floor for that was like seventy dB. I didn't really notice a lot of noise on the input, so it sounded fine to me, and the frequency response is good. And the guy I bought this from, he had checked out the phono stage. It's one of the things he said he worked on. Uh, then we have the input for uh, the CD slash DAT and your tape loop. And then here's your speakers. You get one set of speakers on this little guy, 25 watts per channel into 8 ohms. That's what the power rating is. Although I would tell you, just from my experience listening to this thing, it's underrated. Uh, you don't have to crack that volume control open very far to get it really, really loud. And I I was the last amplifier that I was running. I've had um, a 40 watt per channel and a 50 watt per channel amp before I bought this. And I can't, I, no clue. There's no difference. There's no clue as far as uh, being able to tell a difference between them. They sounded really good. So that's pretty simple. Speaker inputs. An interesting little thing here. We have two AC outlets on the back of the amplifier. Now, I don't know about other countries, but in the United States and Japan and Canada and Mexico, I'm sure, one of the things that audio equipment from the 70s and 80s has is that when you buy an amplifier or a receiver like this, you'll have some extra uh, plugs on the back. Now, the switched plug is designed for your turntable that's what that is there for so that plug is switched when you turn the power on and off and for a receiver of this size and power output to have two is a little bit unusual so that's pretty cool actually uh, I had I've seen some of the I, I think my Akai receiver had like four plugs on the back of it it was amazing you could plug your whole stereo into it and that was back in the 80s as well but uh, and most of the time you'd be lucky if you saw one and that would be the switched output so that's a pretty cool little thing I've just always loved that and no you can't plug a, anything in here that'll suck a lot of power but for a, a basic little setup like in a dorm room where you got a turntable let's say you'd have a turntable and a tape deck and a, that was it or a CD and a tape deck and you weren't using the phono inputs <laughs> one plug does it all you know what I mean so anyway that's the back of the little guy right there. And uh, the sound that comes out of this is, is pretty amazing. I am driving it into a pair of Fluence SS, SX, S as in Sam, X as in X-Ray, six bookshelf speakers. Now these guys are actually looking to be driven by a little bit beefier of an amp. Um, but I never intended to get it very loud, so I didn't think it would be a problem. This little amplifier drives these just fine. Uh, these are new. These are not vintage. Speakers are not something that really are good to have from 30 years ago, because usually uh, you'll find that the little rubber surrounds, the cones, they deteriorate over time, the tweeters deteriorate. So this is something that you want to buy new unless you know how to recone speakers and, and you want to search for drivers. Um, but my attitude has always been, like for instance, there is a set of speakers from this period of time that I absolutely love, the EV Sentry 100A Electro Voice speakers. And I have mentioned them in the past that I really like them. And people say, well, you can get them now. You know, you'll find them on eBay. People are selling them. Shipping will kill you on those things because they're really heavy. The problem is is that the drivers are usually messed up. So what you would have to do is you would have to find modern drivers that would fit. Well, once you've done that, you don't have an Electrovoice EV100A anymore. 
Century 100A. You don't have that speaker anymore. You've got something you've cobbled together now, and it might sound good, and it might not, and I don't care. I'll just buy new speakers. So these little guys are awesome, and I like two-way speakers better than three-way speakers. Um, two-way speakers are more accurate. Uh, another YouTuber who did a review on these speakers, and it's the reason why I bought them, he did this review. I wish I could remember the guy's name. I'd give him credit. Said that these guys were like two subwoofers with tweeters on top of them. <laughs> Sold me there. And uh, they're pretty awesome. And with these modern little speakers, you'd think they're little bookshelf speakers. They're not going to have the oomph. These things got five-inch drivers on them, and they're like pile drivers, man. They, they can pump out the bass. It's amazing what they can do. So... And they're not that expensive either. Fluence is a company up in Canada, builds a bunch of speaker systems, and they also have a turntable that I've heard is not terrible. But I didn't buy one. So uh, those are the speakers I'm using. And with all of that put together, uh, it just sounds wonderful. So uh, some of the other equipment I have plugged in, I have this guy down at the bottom. Um, I bought this refurbished 10 years ago the very first YouTube video that I have is about this machine it's on this channel really early video crappy camera bad audio three parts it's there you can go back and find it if you want to this is a TAC AD500 and it is a CD player cassette deck combo and TAC and Radio Shack are the only two companies that ever built machines like that and I own both of them and I just got fascinated with these about 10 years ago picked one up um, so this is a very very cool machine and like I said there's a video up here on YouTube it's the very first video I ever posted so if you want to have a really good laugh go back and scroll all the way back to the beginning of the videos and, and you will this is a wonderful machine. It really is. And um, I actually just went through this thing and did an electric al electronic alignment on it. I had to uh, set up the bias and the record sensitivity on the tape deck. Uh, my brother was coming to town, and uh, me and my brother, we have just shared an absolute love of audio and tape and records and stuff for years. So I wanted to make him a tape, which is something I haven't done in forever. You know, I wanted to take a bunch of 45s and records and put them on tape. So what I ended up doing was uh, taking this machine out, cleaning it up real good, and doing that electronic alignment, and making him a tape. So <laughs> kind of got back into this guy uh, lately. And it's functioning mainly as a tape deck right now. The CD player in this thing is good. It's not the greatest in the world. But the, the main CD player that I'm using right now is this guy right here. This is a Techniques um, SLPG100. This uh, was about 1993-94. I don't know when these came out exactly, but they used the MASH technology for uh, the codec. Uh, not the codec, that's not the right word. Uh, what am I looking for? Uh, DAC, digital to analog converter. And uh, MASH is no joke, and it wasn't snake oil. It wasn't something that this was an, a real technology that was a step above what came before it as far as uh, producing a pretty clean digital sound and uh, I, um, the main reason I have this deck uh, is because um, I worked in a radio station from 1994 would have been like spring of 94 until 1997 we had these all over the building they were in the studios and they we beat the hell out of them and they just kept going and they sounded really really good on the air and these machines have some features on them that make them really useful in radio stations and in project studios now most radio stations with CD players they would have more expensive professional models but these were these were right up there quality wise and we beat the hell out of them so I had uh, an opportunity to get one a while back and I said boy I want to take a chance on a 25 year old CD player and I bought it off eBay for like oh I don't know seventy dollars which probably was too much 
Um, but I, this is the model that I wanted, and it showed up, and it's just about damn perfect. And it's 25 years old, which is absolutely amazing. So there you go. And finally, the uh, Audio Technica AT. Uh, this is the LP5 Audio Technica A LP5 turntable, which has turned out to be an awesome turntable. If you saw the video that I posted about this a while back when I first got it, uh, a little while ago, uh, I've had a chance to play with it. Yes, the preamp does have that horrible damn freaking noise gate on it. Fortunately, I'm not using it. That's part of the reason of buying these receivers is to be able to plug it into a decent preamp and not have to worry about the garbage. That's you know. This is a $500 turntable. I'm really disappointed about that preamp that's in there. But the turntable itself, uh, the arm, the cartridge that comes with it, which is the AT95EX, which is the newer one, and uh, the direct drive system, it's really well made and sounds really good. So not complaining there at all. The turntable is good. Just don't use the internal preamp. It's a piece of garbage. Uh, every record player that I've had that had one of those crappy internal preamps with the little noise gate on it, what would happen is, is I would play some of my more quiet or classical LPs on it and what would happen is the damn thing would just cut out and I can hear it and of course it's jarring and it makes you go eh, and no, I don't like noise gates on things. Anyway, so that is the system that I have set up and it is a uh, I, I, it's an attempt to recreate a sound. You see, because I decided a while back that my audio obsession, what it was really craving was, was the sound that I heard when I was a kid. And I'm talking about those high school days, and maybe a little bit after that, when this was a big deal. Um, the advent, and I use that word very loosely, of mp3s and digital audios audio and ipods and uh, audio in your phone and people walking around with earbuds and this is how they consume music i think that it has really cheapened music and it's like i have a friend of mine that said you got to think about it you people go into a studio that has hundreds and thousands of dollars worth of equipment to record their song and what it ends up getting played on is this little bitty cheap thing you know and uh, what I really wanted to do was recreate that same sort of sound that I was getting when I was a kid and also you know everybody's all my friends when I went over to their house man you know they'd have a setup like this or at least some parts of it and it was we that was a thing I mean everybody at least all my friends seemed to be into that back in those days. And I was really in awe of it and appreciated um, music. I think when you have real audio equipment that you're listening to music on, and I also think that if it comes from a physical source and that you have to handle it and look at it, that it becomes an entirely different way of appreciating music, whereas just downloading stuff and listening to it on a little speaker in the corner, you know, asking the computer to play it for you that's that's nah that's that's a different thing people have become sort of numb to how cool music and recorded music is i i would suppose uh there's a lot of audiophile talk out there these days a lot of snake oil a lot of garbage a lot of talk about quote unquote reference equipment and the truth of the matter is, is that that's all BS. There is no such thing as a reference anything. Over the years, every speaker, every amplifier, every cartridge, every microphone, every piece of audio equipment that I have ever worked with has its own unique sound. And it's just a matter of finding something that you like and a combination of stuff that you like. It's not so much trying to chase after this notion of perfection because... It really doesn't exist. It just doesn't. And you take this old dumpy little amplifier here. It doesn't... It, it outperforms a lot of the new stuff that I have um, seen or heard in the last few years. It just... It just uh, they, they, like I... Uh, 
you know, I picked up a, I think it was a Sherwood amplifier, real low end, noisy, made a lot, a lot of hissy noise. Uh, then Tiac had an amplifier that was pretty hot and a lot of talk about it, you know, for not too much money, probably about four or five years ago. Well, it's been more than that. It's probably been about 10 years ago, the AG790. And the biggest complaint on it was noise, and that's because they're putting everything on a chip and uh, they're not putting the quality into it that they used to. And these uh, pieces of equipment back in the day, they were not cheap. This amplifier would probably cost you this Scott amplifier. I'm going to guess, because I really don't have any solid numbers on it, but it probably would have been $250 to $300 dollars And that was a lot of money back then. Uh, so nowadays, if you if you put in calculation, that's seven or $800. And for seven or $800, you're not going to get something that sounds as good as this right now it's just it's not really out there uh, for seven or eight hundred dollars in that range you're starting to get into I, it might be a nice amplifier but they're cramming all this uh, stuff on it uh, bluetooth and all that and i'm not into that at all i don't want to stream stuff from my computer or my phone to my stereo um I know that there are people out there that say that physical media is on its way out, but I have several thousand CDs, probably in the neighborhood of 3,000 different CDs, and at this point in time, probably about five to 600 LPs and 45s that beg to differ with you. And I also have every tape that I have gotten pretty much since I was about 14. I think I have hung on to them through the years. And that includes a lot of air checks of me on the radio, and I have boxes and boxes of cassettes. And um, so I need something to play this stuff back on. And that's what I'm trying to do. Uh, this is my escape. This is my, okay, daddy is going to take a break now, and he's going to go in the other room, and he's going to sit down and he's going to listen to music. That's what this is. And when I do that, that's what I'm doing. It's not in conjunction with other activities. I am not looking at the computer and listening to music. I am not reading a book and listening to music. I am not whatever and listening to music. I'm listening to music. Now, on my computer, I have a ton of music. I have a lot of music on this computer, <laughs> probably. I've got like 100 gigabytes of just music. Uh, it's all legal. Got it when I was working in radio. Okay, Didn't steal any of it. And um, so, yeah, when I'm working on the computer, I do listen to music, but that's a little bit of a different deal than like what I'm talking about. This is therapeutic for me, and it has been ever since I was a little boy. My mother, she... Uh, she tells me that when I was like three, she could turn on the radio, go, you know, put me in the den with my dad's stereo on and put it on the radio, and I'd be good for hours. And that's just the way it's been all my life. This is, helps me to cope. Now, before I wrap this rather long video up that I've been rambling on about uh, this little receiver, I want to tell you the story about how it came into my possession because it's weird. Um... My brother, I mentioned making a tape for my brother. My brother was coming in to visit, and I kind of sort of wanted to have a, a better receiver or a better amplifier than I had running. I was running an old Radio Shack realistic uh, ST46 from 1974, and I, I bought it restored, and it was really, it, it was done. It was really making all kinds of weird noises and stuff like that and so I was thinking I'm gonna to have to replace this thing and I do like these old receivers and so I started to look for uh, one and I found one and I looked at a bunch man and I wanted something lower wattage a little lower profile I don't want to have an amplifier that takes up a whole shelf on the rack and everything so I looked at a whole bunch looked at a bunch of the old Akai stuff that I used to like and everything came across one of these and it just called out to me and I just said gee that kind of looks exactly like what I'm looking for so uh, I bought it on eBay guy had to buy it now and he was selling it for a hundred bucks shipping included 
and the dude was in my state and uh, I won't say where because of what happened uh, but he was in my state so I figured oh this is great I'll have this thing in two, two or three days well I never heard anything from him and I contacted I sent him a message through eBay and I said hey is he going to ship this thing message was never answered and then it got to the day when it was supposed to arrive. I sent him another message and never heard a word. Of course, it didn't show up. And then I sent a message through eBay, you know, kind of letting them know, hey, I haven't heard anything from this person. And finally, I had to get my money back. And they, got, they gave me my money back, which was great. But all of this rigmarole took a long time to get through. So when my brother was here, I was using... Uh, uh, a not so great amplifier of course he didn't know the difference you know it's just one of them things man when you're going to be sitting there it's kind of a guy thing it's like you want your you want your best stuff to be you want it to be what you want it to be and sound the way you want it to sound when you're showing it to people you know ego trip deal um so anyway uh, it gives me the money back and i started looking online and now I'm second guessing myself and going, do I really need to get another damn piece of audio equipment? You know, back to school's coming up. I'm going to have to get school supplies for the kids. I could use that money better somewhere else. And I really went back and forth on that. You know, it's the difference between, no, I want, I want my toy and, oh, I have to be a responsible adult. Well, last night... Uh, well, night before last at this point. Let's see. This is It's the middle of the night. I got it today, so it'd be you know, whatever. Uh, I happened to go back and look, and I did a search for this, and one popped up. And it's the next town over that this thing is the guy who's got it. And not only that, he talks about how he went through and cleaned it up, and he's using terms like cleaning the controls with deoxit and checking the capacitors and... Uh, did a thorough check of the phono section with a little note in there that says, by the way, if you're buying receivers, make sure the phono section is checked. It's just really super great thing, right? And the dude wanted $47 and change for it with free shipping. I'm like, okay. <laughs> so I bought it and uh, put the thing in on eBay, get a message from the dude, and he said, you know, I'm, I go by your house every day to go to work. Can I just drop this off tomorrow morning? Sure. So this was hand-delivered to me from this fellow's workbench. Must be some sort of hobbyist because he knows his way about, he knows his electronics, you know, from the way that the ad was written. And he just drove it over here and handed it to me this morning. Now, I didn't keep him very long. I said, thank you very much. But I want to tell you something. I took it in, I hooked it up. And it was as advertised. The thing is in perfect condition, works the way it's supposed to. Near as I can tell, there's nothing wrong with it. Rock and roll, right? Best eBay experience ever. So I uh, don't believe that things happen for by coincidence. I'm just not one of those people. I think there's a reason for everything coming and going in your life. And for some reason or another, I'm meant to have one of these receivers. <laughs> I don't know why, man. It's like, okay, it's just a radio and a, you know, with an amplifier. I didn't get it, but, um, you know, bid on one, lost it, thought better of paying the money. Then one came along at an unbelievable rock bottom price, cleaned and re checked out and refurbished and tested, working great. For 50 bucks, if it breaks down next week, I will not have a problem, you know? I'd be like, okay, $50 is pizza. That's a pizza dinner for, for everybody. You know what I mean? It's not that big of a deal, gang. Um, now, don't get me wrong. I'm, I'm not saying that $50 is throwaway money. I'm just saying that it's in the long run. You know what I mean? I didn't pay hundreds for the thing. So anyhow, that's just my story about this little amplifier. And I hope you guys enjoyed this video. And I've kind of enjoyed rambling on about it. Um... For a while there, I just wasn't all that terribly interested. I still, like I said, I listen to music all the time, but I wasn't making any changes to anything. And uh, lately, I've been kind of reassessing my attitude on it. I'm trying to go for a... I don't want perfection. I'm trying to go for a sound, and I'm getting there. I'm getting there. I'm going back to that same sound that I was hearing in the 1980s, which uh, was when music was just terribly important to me, and... 
you know, I was young and the world was my oyster and my whole life was laid out before me. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Shut up. You're done. All right. Thank you for watching. I certainly do appreciate it. Your comments are always welcome. And uh, you can check out my uh, Linux videos if you are somebody who is here for the audio. Wonder what that's all about? Well, just click on one. I'm sure it'll pop up. You can find out more about alternative computing. That's right. It's community computing. Computing without Microsoft, without Apple. It's your computer, you know, that sort of thing. Anyway, I'm done.